Are we living through a cocktail renaissance or a cocktail revolution? Our guest is here to discuss the movement, whatever you want to call it. I'm Susan Schwartz, your drinking companion, and this is Lush Life Podcast. Every week, we are inspired to live life one cocktail at a time. After realizing a life behind a desk in academia might not be for him, plus having a roommate who decided to make bitters in their apartment kitchen, Eric Koslick found himself happily thrown into the drinks industry. As host of the podcast Modern Bar Cart, Eric is on a mission to make cocktail creation less intimidating by bridging the gap between the geniuses behind the bar and the home bartender. What inspired him to get behind that mic? Well, you'll have to let Eric tell you. It's so great to have you on the show. Thank you for taking the time out of your own podcast to be on mine. It's really thrilled to have you. Yeah, great to be here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. In this crazy time of lockdown, this is the only way I get to see other people who are part of the the bar world. While I was doing my research on you, so you have a lot of quotes that I really, really loved. And something that you said is, what does it take to turn a cocktail renaissance into a cocktail revolution? So... I guess with the renaissance into the revolution, maybe you could tell me how it was either born to you and then reborn in a different way, and -hmm. then how you hope to make it a revolution. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's one of my favorite actually topics in the in the whole cocktail world. I mean, we're we're kind of starting with dessert here, I feel like, which is fine. (laughs) I, I love starting with dessert, but I this whole kind of idea was brought to my attention by uh, a guy in DC, a guy named uh, Derek Brown, who's responsible for incredible bars. The Columbia Room, obviously, is his his big famous project. He, he was very influential in, in making DC a cocktail city. And I remember I was in grad school finishing up and I was just starting to get into cocktails. And I was, I read in one of the pretty common publications at the time. I think it was like an eater or a thrillist publication, uh, a quote by Derek Brown. He said this cocktail revolution or renaissance or whatever you want to call it. And I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Here's this guy kind of in charge of this movement. You know, he he was really spearheading it and, and doing really incredible things. And yet he he didn't choose to really put any thought into what it was called or he didn't care about what kind of label they were putting on it. And to, and to me, I was just wrapping up my master of fine arts and poetry at that point. And so I was very deeply concerned with language. And I started thinking about the differences between a Renaissance and a revolution. And, and just in doing a little bit of research, it occurred to me that there's pretty big differences. Renaissances take place, you know, generally at least starting with and generally sticking in the top levels of society, the people who are the landed gentry, you Mm -hmm. might say of the time, you know, if you think of the Italian Renaissance, you know, people were still living in squalor and dying of plague in the streets while these famous people were creating these masterpieces and works of art. And when you get into the subsequent age, which was the age that kind of was sandwiched between what we call the Renaissance and the age of revolutions was the enlightenment. And and so in the enlightenment, you see some of these big changes taking place. And, and then you get the age of revolution where everyone is involved from top to bottom in these large scale movements. They're not just taking place at the top levels. You know, there's the toppling of monarchies and stuff like that. And so, you know, I, I was, I was thinking back to you know, this probably around 2011, 2012 time period. And it was very vogue at that point to hire a fancy mixologist to redo your bar menu. And that kind of reminded me of hiring somebody to paint your chapel ceiling. So there's there's this kind of like charge of individual genius associated with cocktail renaissances, at least in, in as far as I understand them. And I think that there's a challenge and perhaps an opportunity in that challenge to bring it to the people if you really want to call it a revolution. So I I've since spoken with Derek Brown. I've pressed him on this issue and, and uh, you know, we we've come to an understanding about why he chose not to say that, but you know, if you do choose to make the distinction, uh, it's worth, you know, worth thinking about accessibility and access of 
ingredients of ideas and stuff like that. So I know that was a kind of a ramble, but hopefully that addressed the, your question. Using that quote as a starting place, I'd love to hear about how cocktails were introduced to you, okay? And how you had a renaissance about it and started Modern Bar Cart, because I think that you are creating a revolution of home bartenders. You know, you ha are breaking stuff down that we learn from above and bringing it to the people, the home bartenders. So why don't we start with the cocktail birth or your introduction to cocktails and how you even started to your bitters company or I started to enjoy a cocktail or want to be part of that life. Yeah. Well, I guess maybe we should just start with my first cocktail. I actually didn't grow up in a family that really drank. I mean, there was some Canadian beer in the fridge that sat there for most of the year until an Easter or a Thanksgiving or something. But it was not a family that, that really put emphasis on alcohol at all. So I, I you know, I was pretty insular growing up. And I wasn't exposed to cocktails at all or, or even spirits. And there was this like legendary bottle of Canadian whiskey hiding in a cabinet somewhere that maybe got broken out if somebody had a severe cold and needed a toddy, but it was very medicinal in that respect. So I, my first cocktail was in, I got to say 2010. And I was working at a little restaurant. My, I, have, I was studying on campus doing a research grant for the summer and my advisor's daughter was having a baby. And, and so she needed somebody to fill in for her at this little restaurant that really had no right to exist. It was a place called Pomona's. It was uh, one town north of Gettysburg, which is where I went to school, Gettysburg College, in a town called Biglerville, Pennsylvania, uh, which is where the Musselman's Applesauce Factory is located. And I, I know it well. I'm a Pennsylvanian myself. Okay. Yeah. So yep. Biglerville, not exactly what you would consider the height of dining culture, perhaps, but this is like a little cafe. It was a bakery and cafe during the day and then for weekend brunches and all week dinners, it turned into this restaurant called Pomona's named after the goddess of apples and stuff like that. And it was run by this. He was only 28 years old at the time. His name was Sean Wolf. He had two kids and another on the way. And he was doing this magical wood fired cuisine from the Galicia, the Galician region of Spain. And just doing incredible things that just it was it was this beautiful crystal that should not have existed and and it didn't after about a year but while i was there with him uh, i remember i said something one night and i was like I was like man i can't believe like tips are so low or something and then he just looked at me with like the tired dad face and said do you realize you make more in a day than i do and it was just this like it was this realization of like oh man <laughs> like i just messed up big time so the next day i went to the liquor store and i i wanted to get him a bottle because i knew he enjoyed bourbon and so i wanted to get him a nice bottle of something that would be like an apology for hey sorry about that thing I said. And so I got a bottle of Maker's Mark, which in 2010, you know, Maker's Mark, it's got the red wax. It, it looked good and it is good. Yes. So, so I, I picked that up for Sean and I, I brought that to the restaurant and apologized. And the first thing he did was pour us each a little pour. And, but this was to, to make room in the bottle because then what he did is he made a simple syrup. He told me to go outside and pick mint from the garden that we had and he basically poured in that simple syrup and stuffed the mint right in the bottle, shook it up and stuck it in the walk-in freezer. And then that evening after service, we pulled chairs out into the empty gravel parking lot under like a little, little awning. And I had my first mint julep. I love that way of making mint juleps, by the way. That, mm -hmm. And what a great drink to start with. You mm -hmm. know, definitely one of my favorites. Now, so did you understand bourbon? Did you understand anything? Nothing. No, You're shaking your no, head. No. Or just um, just like beer in college you were drinking or yeah, not even. I, yeah, yeah. Yingling being from Pennsylvania. So we had yeah. the, the Yingling and and we I was starting to, you know, to branch out a little bit, but spirits were still something that was foreign to me. So that moment for me was it was very it was magical. It was a, uh, to me a magical first cocktail it was an apology. It was like this revelation. Uh, like my first cocktail was a large format cocktail. Most people don't have a batched cocktail for their first cocktail. I didn't even register what was going on. Did you number one? Did you realize you were drinking a cocktail? You know what I mean? 
Not really. I, I don't think if it was you just a good me, Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that, that summer working there really got me to focus on flavor because I, I had never had food that good. And then the, the, the cocktail experience really made something click in my mind. So I, I started really investing my own time, not so much research, not, I, I didn't go out and get a job in a bar after that, but I did really spend a lot more time thinking about it. And, and so I moved down to, to Maryland for grad school. And, and during that time is when I started learning how to drink actual spirits, you know, some, some of the started with some of the bourbons. And then I remember my now co-founder, then, then friend and roommate, Ethan Hall brought home a bottle of Johnny Walker red one, one night and said, you know, people in the business world drink scotch. I got to learn to drink scotch. And so that was a little project that he painfully worked his way through that first bottle of Johnny Walker Red. And then I remember he was making uh, cocktail bitters in the kitchen as a little DIY holiday present for his family. And so he and I work really well together in the kitchen, but we're always trying to bring it just a little bit to the next level, not in a competitive way, but like, oh, what if we did this? Or what if we tried this next time? So he and I began iterating that that simple aromatic bitters recipe. And, and after, you know, a few iterations, we got it to the point where we're like, hey, we could probably sell this. And, uh, you know, so he filed some paperwork with DC. I launched a website and- Wait, wait. The- now, before we get to your bitters, after your Maker's Mark experience, and then before you, the bitters, in that time, were you starting to fall in love with the bar culture, the restaurant scene? Was it something that you did on the weekends, you know, while you were working a regular job? Yeah. So I was in grad school at that time and I was living just outside of DC. And so I do remember a couple of times we we actually did make excursions into DC and, and I don't think that I was really... I was really introduced to the cocktail bar scene in DC until after we had started playing around with the bitters. It was sort of academic. I really didn't spend too, too much time in in bars until we actually moved into DC proper, which was probably about 2012, 2013. Yeah. Now, now I read that you went to Oxford for a certain amount of time. I actually studied at Cambridge as a graduate. And that's where I learned how to drink. I mean, really drink. And I was wondering if you had the same experience in Oxford, you know, a bar in your college, that kind of thing. Um, so Ox, I don't want to overbill this. I, I was a, It was a semester abroad in Bath, UK, and uh, the professors were from Oxford. And I actually had a tutorial where uh, once a week I would take the train into Oxford. And we did, we did spend a, a week uh, kind of immersive in, in Oxford. Lovely city. I was able to make it to the Turf Tavern where Bill Clinton did not inhale. I was able uh, to make it to whichever whichever tavern or pub Tolkien and Lewis did their conspiratorial work at, and mostly beer. Then I we I remember we did a in two thousand and nine or two that was two thousand and ten. So I was just turning twenty one. And there was a cider festival. Of course, this was the south of England. So I got to taste some real like natural fermented ciders for the first time. And other than that, it was just sort of sloppy drinking Lambrini on the train and stuff like that. It it was not (laughs) classy in the least. Please, I drank so much Diamond White, which for those who don't know, is a very, very high, high in alcohol cider, which a lot of rugby players drink. So yes, I had some difficult mornings there you know, Mm -hmm. drinking that. All right. So coming back to your time in DC, when you were playing around in the kitchen and this bitters thing became a thing, became a company, did you think now I'm going to pack up my job? It's all happening now. Yeah. Well, so I, I'm a bit problematic in that I'm not a very good office worker or I'm not very good at behind a desk. I have a problem with authority, which most managers generally don't like. What else? And I'm just kind of antsy. I'm intellectually antsy. I don't like being told what to do or how to do it. And and so I was just doing, because I had gotten two unrelated degrees in the humanities, I was virtually unemployable in the business world outside of marketing. And I was not enjoying my legal marketing job jobs. So when the bidders got a little bit too much to be a side hustle, like a nights and weekends type situation, I was happy to volunteer to no longer have to sit behind a desk. And one of the things that 
I think is a common through line in the the entrepreneurial world or the business world, whether you're talking about a bar or a restaurant or a distillery or a spirits brand is that you always have to solve for the economic problem. And uh, I'm very lucky in that uh, my wife uh, has a great job and and solved for that problem. So it's not it, it's not easy. But if you have somebody who can help you solve that economic problem, then that's when you actually get to do some of the cool stuff. Of course, I totally understand. Now with bitters, how did you know what was going to be your first recipe? I mean, we have the Angostura and the pay shows already around. What did you think that you could bring to bitters that those two hadn't done already or that you hadn't seen on the market? Yeah. So we started with aromatic and orange because at this, at the time when we launched, I think we launched at an event called DC Veg Fest in 2010, I think, 2009, 2010, maybe 2013. I don't know. It's uh, many, many, many years ago at this point, but we thought we were really smart launching at this event because who's going to know about bitters? It's going to be these these hippie vegans with their essential oils and their tinctures and their extracts. And, and even though we thought we had picked this incredibly targeted audience, we still spent the entire event explaining what bitters were to people. So we knew that aromatic and orange were going to be important because they were the ones that were called for in a recipe and people follow recipes, especially in the cocktail world. It, it's like this, it's, it's very almost taboo to go off script in certain respects. And so if uh, something calls for orange bitters, you need orange bitters, aromatic, aromatic. So uh, since those were the two highest density mentions in the cocktail literature, we wanted to have examples of those so that people could could enjoy them without the the fear of like, oh, lavender bitters or like, oh, curry bitters. Like, what the heck am I going to do with this? Well, you just follow the recipe. It says aromatic or it says orange. So it was mostly a, a numbers play for us. Our aromatic is a Creole style, so it would be more in line with the Peychaud's flavor profile than with the Angostura. It's definitely uh, a nisi, vanilla y. It's got clove, allspice, black pepper, a ton, a little bit of eucalyptus in there, a lot of, a lot of those uh, anise or mentholated flavors. And so it makes our aromatic bitters makes a, a great take on most of those New Orleans classics like the Sazerac or the mm -hmm. Bucare or something where you'd find a couple dashes of Peychaud's bitters. The big difference is that we don't actually sweeten any of our bitters. So that's, that's something that, that is kind of striking about our collections in that bitters were historically sweetened because, well, it's kind of medicine. You got you to gotta do something to make it at least a little tiny bit palatable. And back in the day when the cocktail was invented as the cocktail where it's spirits, sugar, water, bitters, again, referencing the Derek Brown there, you know, the spirits were much rougher back then. So that yeah. little bit of sugar in the bitters was actually an asset. Whereas now with distilling technology where it is and the products that we're enjoying being so high quality, I don't think you really need that sugar in there. You're not trying to cover anything up anymore. You're trying to just kind of enhance things. And so it's a, it's a slightly different product project now than bitters making was perhaps 100, 150, 200 years ago. So we're just trying to update it a little bit, not being too controversial. And then just in terms of the the orange bitters, you know, it, it kind of along the same lines. We're like, hey, what if we do like one thing really well? Just be good at being orangey. So, you know, the revolutionary thing we do there is we extract it full 190 proof and we pull all of the essential oils out of those orange peels. We don't throw too, too much in to, to complicate it in terms of other ingredients, just enough to balance out the flavor profile. And when you pull those orange peels out of the extraction vessel, when you extract it that high a proof, you can literally snap an orange peel like a piece of crispy bacon. That's how many of the oils have been pulled out of the skins into the extract. And after you created these and started to talk to people about them, is that when you really started to get introduced to this whole world. Yeah, I remember pitching. We had the aromatic and the orange, and then we had just launched our lavender bitters, which was a, a very big project for us. Uh, lavender is a very tricky ingredient to work with. And I was pitching one of the DC bar guilds. We have two. We have more, sort of like a DC bar guild, and then we have a chapter of the USBG here as well. So I was pitching one of those two bar guilds, and that was sort of my first 
glimpse into how the bar world operated. And I remember I walked into this random bar in DC, a neighborhood I wasn't really familiar with and and came in. They said, okay, yeah, sit here. Here's here's the other guy who's going to be presenting. And I was sort of an older gentleman, uh, sort of portly. He had a brimmed hat on and, you know, you could just sort of almost imagine a walking stick in his hand, even though there wasn't. And uh, I was like, oh, hey, I'm Eric. He's like, hi, my name's Dave. I'm like, oh, what do you do? He says, well, I, I make I make rye whiskey. And, and so I just chatted with him. I was like, oh, I make bitters. And and he was very kind. And and then he gets up and it turns out it's Dave Pickerel, who used to be the head distiller at Maker's Mark. And he was then with Whistle Pig. Dave is unfortunately no longer with us, but he was pouring samples of their Old World series, the Whistle Pig Old World series, which was like a saut. They had a sauterne cask finish. They had a port cask finish and and probably some something like an Oloroso sherry finish as well. And so he's pouring these, you know, 110 US dollar bottles at minimum to these bartenders. He takes 45 of his 15 minutes and then I get up to pitch my bitters and it's almost like, it's almost like Led Zeppelin opening for a garage band. You know, they were everything short of booing me at that uh-huh. point. They were like, Bring back Dave. <laughs> and that was my first opportunity to kind of get in front of bartenders and get their feedback and, and work with them and, and uh, really take their needs into consideration. And that's when I began forming some relationships here in DC. And, and the other cool thing that I got to do that, that really got me sort of connected with the the industry as a whole is I also started working with people who were creating spirits around that time. So visiting distilleries in DC, Maryland, and Virginia primarily, uh, I was able to meet some some people who are still my partners today. It's been amazing not only to work with the people who are making the cocktails, but also the people who are producing the spirits. And I call myself industry support staff. So I don't have a specified role aside from communicating, but if there's a bartender or a distiller who needs something, chances are I can either help or tell them, oh, hey, there's somebody over here doing that. Maybe you should talk to them. So I I really think of myself as industry support staff in this journey. Uh, Well, since you brought up communicating, you know, you are such a communicator now, but going from creating bitters and selling them and to having a hugely successful podcast for the home bartender is not an obvious uh, path. Were you starting to become your own home bartender just out of default because you were making the bitters and having to create cocktails? Totally, totally. Yeah, I remember the, there was a couple of cocktails I invented around this time when I was thinking about this Derek Brown quote. Actually, one of them uh, I called the the stopping by woods, and I got this rum from a distillery that we were starting to work with. And I made an old fashioned, but I muddled rosemary in with it. I use our uh, aromatic bitters and it was just a rum old fashioned with rosemary. And here I was thinking that I was like bringing something totally new to the table. And uh, so that was probably the first cocktail I invented, which was a old fashioned format. And then the next one was called the Flower of Normandy. And this was at the time when the Saint Germain was becoming very popular. This was bartenders catch up delight season. And so it was new to the market. And I got my bottle of elderflower. And I had also gotten the chance to taste Calvados when I I, I took, I've taken a couple trips to France and apple uh, or in general, fruit distillates are my favorite distillate base. And so I I made like a Calvados and elderflower with orange bitters cocktail. And that's just a Manhattan, you know? So the first two cocktails I, I invented were very simple. I don't think I even realized at the time I was making an old fashioned and a Manhattan. And so it just sort of evolved from there. So after those two little custom projects, I started getting a little bit more serious about learning the different formats and, you know, going through the Negronis, the Boulevardiers, the last words of of the world. And you know, trying to understand how these cocktails evolved. And, and then, of course, you, you start doing the reading and you be, be begin to connect some of the historical touch points as well. Oh, absolutely. It must have been right up your alley. Having studied and almost become a professor mm-hmm. of poetry and rhetoric. I mean, you're fabulous with words. If anyone has listened to your podcast, you know, and your rants. You're just an, ama- an amazing talker. And I guess that comes back to one another quote about blowing a spark into a flame. And so talk me through how you decided to become the champion of the home bartender. I, mean, yeah. I kind of see this connected to, you know, you're wanting to be a professor and now 
um, transferring that to the cocktail world instead of the, the literature world. Yeah. Uh, so I was listening, you know, when I was working those sort of soulless marketing jobs, I remember I, I started listening to podcasts and I was not an early podcast adopter. I tend not to be an early adopter of most things, but I started listening to this podcast. It was also based here in DC called the Speaking Easy Podcast. And it was just a couple of guys who got together and talked every week about a different type of cocktail. And they would make a cocktail, they'd maybe make a riff or two on it. And it was it was really interesting. So I actually got to talk with those guys. I went on their show and, and talked about bitters. And at that point, I was like, I looked at it, I'm like, this isn't really all that complicated to do a podcast. I mean, it is complicated to do a good podcast, but it's, it's not complicated to just start and, and, and then pick up things along the way. Uh, so that's what I did. I started and this was around the same time when we rebranded from just embitterment bitters to modern bar cart. One of the things that, you know, going back to that education moment where we had to teach people what bitters were, education has always been like super important to what we do. And so I knew that when we rebranded to Modern Bar Card at the same time when I went full time, I wanted there to be a serious education component to what we do and knowledge base, so to speak. And podcasting at that time seemed to still be on the rise. I, I don't know if I'd call podcasting still on the rise right now. I think the video medium is beginning to take over a little bit. But at the time, it was still very much on a, on a pretty, pretty steep curve. And so it was a good time for me to get in. And I just started producing episodes. And I, I remember the, the first kind of chunk of episodes, you might call it like the first 50 episodes or so, were very much intended to be foundational. And so we talked about, you know, basic intros, bar cart hardware, bar cart software. That's what I call the, the liquid stuff on the bar cart versus the, the tools that you use to, to make the cocktails. And as I was able to get more and more guests on, they were able to connect me with more guests. And, and so even though I'm not somebody I would consider well-connected in, in the social sense, I've been able to use these connections uh, through the podcast just by giving a little bit of value, giving people a platform to talk. And probably the most important one for me was when I uh, interviewed uh, a gentleman over in, in your area called David T. Smith, who's the author of the, uh, the Gin Dictionary. And he then invited me to uh, be a judge for the American Distilling Institute at their annual judging of craft spirits, which put me at a rum table sitting next to Jeff Barry. Fab. Like, like crazy, you know, so just by interviewing this guy and letting him talk about his book, mm -hmm. it just got me into a whole new level. And so the podcast is not only about, you know, investigating things that I find interesting. It's, it's about bridging that gap between like, people who are absolute geniuses is what they do and home consumers and basically acting as that translator medium. And to, to your point earlier, like, you know, why did I start this? Well, I, at the time I, I didn't really see anybody serving that translator role and including home bartenders into the conversation with other industry folks. It was either an industry focused podcast or a home bartender focused podcast. You're either the speakeasy where it's bartenders talking to bartenders and distillers, or you are the Speaking Easy podcast, who is home bartenders talking to home bartenders. So I thought, hey, why don't we just cross the streams here and see what that mashup looks like? And, and it turns out that people are smarter than, than we sometimes give them credit for. They actually really enjoy the nerdy deep dives. And I was there to facilitate that. I, I hate talking down to people. And so the podcast has been a great opportunity to give those high level insights from people who are incredibly skilled at what they do, and then just give a little bit of translation so that people at home are like, oh yeah, makes sense. So you so, get it. I, no, I totally get it. This is the revolution. How did you decide that you thought it's the home bartender I want to talk to? Mm -hmm. Is it that because you were the home bartender or your, your clients were the home bartender? Yeah. I, I mean, the, the the way that I maybe maybe this will 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 sort of click with people. The way that I approach cocktails is is actually very simple. It's it's based on something called affordance theory, right? So so I, I pick up this water bottle here. Well, what does it afford? Simply like it, it is hollow, so it affords holding liquid. It is cylindrical, so if I placed it on the ground, it would roll. And uh, it's got this little screwy top thing. Oh, and that that opens just like that. And so simply by walking up to an object and turning it over in your hands and just asking a few simple questions of it, 
you can make some pretty good educated guesses about its function and its form. And, you know, the way that I apply this to spirits and cocktails is that I have never been afraid of them. And, and yet I have seen many situations where people are, for example, afraid of putting three dashes of bitters in their cocktail instead of two. That's something that I always run into is like, well, what if I, what if I do, th- can I do three or should, is that too much? It's like, no, you're not going to break the cocktail by putting one extra dash of bitters in there. And so w- what I wanted to do was give content that made people think a little bit more like me in, in that they wouldn't be afraid to uh, approach some of these things that seem intimidating. I mean, chartreuse, 120 herbs and spices, and intimidating. Well, just put it in a cocktail with some lime juice, some gin, and a little bit of maraschino, shake it up and see what happens, right? It it doesn't need to be this intimidating thing. So I I guess the affordance theory, the simple like walk up to this thing, ask it a few questions and and see what you can do from there is is the type of ethos that I really wanted to bring. And I I think it's it's resonated with people. You know, it is it is an empowerment thing because in the home bar. There are so many things that you can't do. You can't do mise en place before a shift at your home bar. There, you, you can't have like a clear ice machine that just cranks out these clear cubes by by the poundful every hour. There's a lot of things you can't do. And so if you have somebody who can translate and kind of give you little ideas of inspiration of things that you can do, suddenly you find yourself way more empowered. And so I think that's that's the project, I guess. It, it's very much in the demystification space. But in demystifying, the one thing that we're, we're really careful to try and not do is to gloss over or break the magic. We still, we still engage with the magic, but we just make it magic that doesn't seem so scary. Sometimes you do find it paralyzing because you don't have the space. It's like every video you see someone behind this lovely space. I have a tiny, tiny um, kitchen with like a British size refrigerator. And you know, it's these things that we have to deal with yet you can make a drink. And I think your, your podcast has really helped people out there who might be paralyzed because they're going to Lioness for a cocktail and going home and going, well, I can't, there's no way I can make that. You know, I have some bitters. I'm not really sure what to use them for. You mentioned the the uh, the dandelion. I remember going to Tails. I think my I don't know if it was my first or second year at Tails, but I ended up just incidentally not even looking at the presenters of the seminars. Go uh, signing up for several seminars with Ian Griffiths, who spun out of that group and and did a project called Trash Tiki, and and very much yeah. you know I. I I very much appreciated his approach because it was very, very, it was very punk. It was very DIY. And I I think, you know, if you want to get a little bit, put a little bit finer of a point on this whole idea of a revolution, it doesn't necessarily need to be, you know, heads rolling into baskets and, and blood flowing in the street type of revolution, but it could be something that looks a little bit more like the punk revolution. And DC is is a very punk city in in some respects, not in the the ones that mostly make the newspapers, but DC as a city is a very punk city. And so I think that's why I found a, a good home and a set of sympathetic collaborators here. And what have you found since the beginning of your podcast to now? Have you found your fans or have changed or become more sophisticated or asking you questions that you never even thought you would get at the beginning? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, one one big change, uh, at least in terms of my mindset for the podcast, was like when I was nearing that 50 podcast episode mark, I was starting to get worried. I was like, man, we did the old fashioned episode. We did the, this episode, the that episode. Am I going to run out of content at like 50 episodes? And and then there came a point after that when I started transitioning more heavily to interviews where, where that, that uh, worry was sort of assuaged. But uh, in terms of the listeners, we've been over the last year, I'd say, getting some really, really uh, cool listeners who are really engaged. And, and I'm actually, I'm at the very early stages, so I don't even expect this to to be a thing until maybe 2022. But we're, we're hoping to start supporting other people who want to uh, make content. We're, we're hoping to empower some of our listeners to maybe start writing some articles and, and publishing them uh, in a blog format, uh, because we as Modern Barkhart have 
a, a little bit of legitimacy, a little bit of, you know, a sort of a critical mass of people who think we know what we're talking about. And so it would be great if we could use some of that to provide home bartenders with a, an outlet to start writing and, and publishing stuff as well. So that's something that's maybe on the horizon for us as well. And, and that would uh, involve certainly some of the, the listeners that we have now who are doing incredible things. I have a number of listeners who submit regularly to the Home Bar Awards Instagram page. Yeah. And they're making these incredibly detailed, they're making better cocktails than I could make. And so it's, it's kind of cool to see the listeners being so engaged and, and uh, sending us recommendations for guests and, and making requests of us. I had a listener correct my pronunciation of the Michelada and I was calling it the Michelada. Uh, and so I had a listener write in. So I said, great, record that. We're going to stick that in the episode. And, and, you know, so we're, we're beginning to now try and incorporate the listeners more and more than we have ever done. And I guess we're also working on launching some live streams to do that. Like what I'm really excited about for 2021 is we're going to be doing themed spirits tastings and then also some bottle review episodes. And at least for the theme tastings, we're publishing the bottles that we're going to be tasting ahead of time so that people can actually go out if they choose, pick up those bottles. And when we do the live stream, taste in real time with somebody who's doing it. And I think that's about as close in a pandemic to social drinking as you're going to get, because you have that, even if you're not in the same room together, you have that shared liquid in your glass. And there's a type of eye contact there. It's not the type of eye contact you would make at a bar, but it's the type of eye contact that you make with your palates in different places. And I, I think that's maybe not the same, but still kind of magical. Absolutely. I'm already have it in my diary for the bourbon one. And so how have you seen this translate into your bitters company? Has it taken away time that you have to make more bitters? Well, time is certainly a, a problem when you're trying to, you know how labor intensive it is to produce a podcast. I have oh, yeah. an incredible editor who helps a ton. I have a, a couple of different production interns who I don't call interns. They're my producers. They just kind of rotate in and out as as semesters do. But yeah, it's it's a lot of work to do the podcast and the sales. And we launched e-commerce a couple of years ago. And we last year, we started adding a bunch of bar tools and glassware and stuff to our website. So it is a little hectic to be running to UPS to drop off e-commerce orders and then running back home for a podcast interview and trying to tire out the puppy who's currently sleeping in the next room so he doesn't make noise during the podcast. It, it gets very laborious very quickly. Uh, so we're excited this year to be actually getting somebody else to make the bitters for us. We have a, a partner who's in the other bittered products space. I can't really say more than that, but it's somebody who's very, very capable of uh, taking our formulations and uh, not just replicating them, but probably maybe even helping to make them just that little bit better. And so we're getting manufacturing, taking off our plate, and then hopefully also partnering with somebody to do the distribution side of things so that we can focus more on the podcast, more on the content and do what we do best and enjoy doing most. Fabulous. Now, I always ask, as I said, people for their top tips for the home bartenders. Asking you that is like, we'll, we'd be here for thousands of years. But do you have your, your top, top, top tips um, yeah. for, that, I could, that I could share? Yes. Yeah. So the, the one is, it's not so much a tip, but it's, it's almost like a trajectory recommendation for people as they, you know, it, it, imagine that somebody were to listen to this and say, man, I'd really like to get into home bartending, having not even a mixing glass to their name. The way I'd recommend getting into cocktails from a home bartender perspective is kind of what I would call a specificity sandwich. When you start out you want to be really specific because you need to know what bottles to pick up. So you need to know the ingredients of an old fashioned. You need to know the ingredients of a martini and how much of each of them to put into that mixing glass or shaker so that you come out with a good cocktail. Measuring and specificity is very important in the early days of learning cocktails. And then as you pick them up, the best thing to do then, in my opinion, is to kind of zoom out and, and get more general. And that's when you start to make connections like, oh, that cocktail I just invented that I thought was so special. That's just the Manhattan, right? And this is the Manhattan format and the Negroni format. And, and here's how the hanky panky, you know, kind of splits the difference between that. And, and so as you, as you begin to encounter cocktails in the wild, you use this generalization template that you've built 
by these individual experiences to put things into buckets. And when you are able to put something into a bucket, it becomes much more approachable. You're like, oh, well, that's just a Manhattan. No, that's that's just a Negroni. But instead of gin, they're using mezcal. It's just a mezcal Negroni. Great. I got this. And then once you get really comfortable with that, it's time to once again, make yourself uncomfortable on the other side of that by getting specific again. And one of your wonderful guests, David Wondrich, wrote an incredible uh, article in the Daily Beast, uh, maybe a year, year and a half ago called uh, Plato and Aristotle Walk Into a Bar. And it's where he talks about the differences between the daiquiri, the uh, caipirinha, and the tea punch, which are all ostensibly just rum sours, where you have a little bit of sweet, a little bit of sour, a little bit of cane spirit. And so you can talk about them all as a rum sour. That's putting it all in a generic bucket. But you could also say, well, but if you look at the tea punch, there's this very specific way they cut the lime and then they muddle it into the glass. And so you get the expressed oils of the lime peel in there. And so in that respect, the tea punch is very different than the caipirinha, is, and it, which is again, very different from the classic daiquiri. And so those two modes, being able to think generally about cocktails and then being able to think specifically about them, seeing the forest and then seeing the trees. Once you start seeing the trees again on the other side of the forest is when you know you, you've you really kind of come into your own as a, as a home bartender, in my opinion. And so there's a time and a place for both types of thinking. And the I think the goal as you progress on your journey as a home bartender is to is to get there, to get to where you can see both the forest and the trees and appreciate them each in their own way. I love that. I love that. I'm going to use that. Thank you. Please. It's yours. <laughs> now, if you could be anywhere drinking anything right now, where would that be? That would be, I thought, for this interview, appropriately, New Orleans. I missed Tales of the Cocktail this year. They did a really great job hustling and, and getting some digital offerings out there. But when I watched those digital offerings, one of the things I really missed was you know, having the caps come around and, and hand out the little cocktails mm -hmm. that were supposed to accompany that. And, and, I, and then being able to leave that seminar and join a friend for a drink at one of the amazing bars in, in New Orleans. And so I thought my answer would be um, the Empire Bar at the Broussard, which is actually right across the street from Tales of the Cocktails' new home at the, at the uh, Royal Sinestra Hotel. And this is the first place that I went for a drink the first year that I was at Tales of the Cocktail. And it's this beautiful, bright, I love bright bars. It's a beautiful marble bright bar, well lit next to a courtyard. And I met this bartender there called Paul Gustings. And not only did he make me incredible cocktails in this beautiful bar that I, I just, I felt like a million bucks just sitting at, uh, but he also was able to, you know, kind of give me the lay of the land, tell me how to navigate the French quarter. So not only was it a great hospitality experience, uh, but also a great cocktail experience. And I, I'm, I'm dying to get back there. Oh, me too. So I'm there with you. So thank you so much. It was so wonderful to have you on the show. I really appreciate you taking the time. Yes, thank you. And, and maybe uh, next time Tails is in person, we can meet up for a drink. Absolutely. Absolutely. I can't wait. Yeah. Thanks for having me, Susan. Thanks so much to Eric for joining me on the show today. Don't forget to check out his bourbon tasting later on in the month. But before we start imbibing bourbon, let's head to our Cocktail of the Week, which is also Eric's favorite. Drinking out of a coupe glass always transports me back to the 1920s. It should this time, because that's when our Cocktail of the Week, the last word, was invented. It hails from Detroit, more specifically the Detroit Athletic Club, and has more recently become a darling of the cocktail renaissance, or should I say revolution. With its equal parts of gin, green chartreuse, maraschino liqueur, plus the lime juice to give it zing. As Eric reminded me, the garnish is traditionally a brandy cherry that sits at the bottom of the coop and can be eaten when the glass is drained. A last word of sorts. So, combine all of these ingredients in a shaker with ice. Three quarters of an ounce of gin, three quarters of an ounce of green chartreuse, three quarters of an ounce of Luxarda Maraschino liqueur, and three quarters of an ounce of fresh lime juice. Shake, shake, shake. 
Then double strain into that 1920s coupe glass and garnish with that brandied cherry. You'll find these recipes, more classic cocktail recipes, and all the cocktails of the week at alushlifemanual.com, where you'll also find all the ingredients in our shop. Big news. I had my vaccination, at least my first jab, which means no alcoholic beverages for a week. I know it's just really 24 hours, but I'm being super careful. So excited to be making cocktails with my Seed Lip, Acorn, Wilfrids, and all the other great non-alcoholic spirits I have in the house. So, if you live for Lush Life, make sure you're giving back to the bars or restaurants you love by donating or taking part in cocktail or food delivery where you live. Theme music for Lush Life is by Stephen Shapiro and used with permission. And Lush Life is always and will be forever produced by Evo Terra and Simpler Media Productions. Which leaves me to say the wise words of Oscar Wilde, all things in moderation, including moderation. And always drink responsibly and wash your hands and wear a mask. Next week, we'll be taking a week break and then jumping into our new season. I'm calling it our how to drink season. Not to leave you on a cliffhanger or anything, but you'll hear more about it from me next Tuesday. Until that time, bottoms up.